Welcome to So You're Kinda a Big Deal, a weekly podcast deep diving into the lives of emerging and established tattoo artists. Listen in as we dig into origin stories, industry hot topics, and what it takes to survive in the world of tattooing. This is Tattoo Shop Talk. Join your hosts, Sean Headley and Dave Allen, every week as we host a new guest. It's no secret Dave and I have a good guy connection, but we have a great relationship with many respected suppliers. Working with Lucas Ford at Classic Tattoo, I saw firsthand the blood, sweat, and stress he went through building Good Guy. Creating products for your peers is no easy task. With many to critique any small missteps, including myself, tattooer owned and family operated since day one. With Lucas, Rob, and Natalie at the helm, you know exactly what you are getting. High quality products, fair prices, and excellent customer service. Shop, support, Good Guy. Get the lead yeah. out. Yeah. Huh. Anyways. Man. All right, buddy. Cool. Today's your day to shine. Oh, fuck. Ah, oh, Dave <laughs> Allen. Welcome not to looking forward kind of to this. Deal. <laughs> Tell us who you are. Also, thanks to Good Guy Supply for being a consistent supporter of this podcast. Yeah, Lucas and Rob are great. They treat us good. <laughs> All right, tell us all about yourself. Uh, Dave Allen, and I'm a tattooer. What what do you want to know? Well, tell everybody where you got your start. Okay. Yeah, we can start there. I'm going to go back a little bit just because I think it sets us. I think it's important. It is to me anyway. So my oldest brother was... Everything's always important to you. No, I know. It is. Shit is no, important. Yeah, go back. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when I was in my early 20s, 21, my oldest brother was uh, killed. And like any anybody that age, it would send you for a fucking loop. It fucks you up. And I moved out west. And I spent a few years just kind of aimlessly wandering around trying to figure out who the fuck I was and trying to find some place to belong because I was suddenly nowhere near my family. And uh, I was looking for direction and I walked into Sacred Heart one day because uh, Clint had actually pointed me to go that way. I'd already been getting tattooed quite heavily by Adam Sky and uh, some others, uh, Dustin Croach. Uh, and I ran into you Sean met Clint original. You met Clint originally in the Okanagan, correct? Uh, no, I met him in Vancouver originally. And it was I was growing weed at the time in South Vancouver, uh, South Burnaby, South Vancouver. And he his friends lived in South Burnaby or new West, something like that. And I was good friends with them from the Okanagan. Oh, okay. uh, so we were all about you Dustin. Uh, I met Dustin in Kelowna. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Just through as a snowboard bum and my friends were getting tattooed by him and uh, we hit it off right away and became super tight. And he did some great tattoos on me. And then when I moved to the coast, I want to get shit finished and get new tattoos I went to see Clint and he was like, well, I'm not going to finish that work. You should go to see Sean or Adam at Sacred Heart. And I'd already been tattooed by Adam. Uh, and I talked to him and he was like, well, you should probably talk to Sean Headley. It's more his style. And uh, <laughs> we hit it off like gangbusters. <laughs> Two kids from Scarborough meeting out West. I mean, I got goosebumps just thinking about it right now. It was like... <laughs> immediately insulting each other <laughs> and you know it was just fun right like so i that was a a critical time for me personally i i I've, sacred heart with a was an open studio in every sense like not just to welcome new people in but it was an open environment people are drawing openly together it was everything was really collaborative everybody was my age so it was a it was just like a place you wanted to be. And I'd been hanging out at tattoo shops prior to this and trying to soak up as much knowledge as I could with no intention of learning, just fucking curious. And uh, yeah, it just felt like Sacred Heart just felt like a home, it felt like a place I, I felt, I guess, emotionally safe there. I felt comfortable, you know? I was, so I'd go there every day after work. I lived in Richmond at that time and I'd drive all the way across town after work to hang out. Sweet Volvo station wagon. Yeah, yeah. 
And I would drive over on my days off and just hang out and just ask questions endlessly and be a nuisance and run for coffees and get people lunch and whatever they needed just, just to hang out, you know? And yeah. Well, Sean, my, do, you, do you remember my coffee order? <laughs> oh, half coffee, half hot chocolate, six sugars, seven sugars, seven sugars. Yeah. Yeah. It was fucking gross. <laughs> I remember the guy in the gas station was like, why do you drink that shit? That's horrible. It even smells bad. I was like, it's not for me. And he was like, sure. <laughs> you get them all the time. And I'm like, it's not for me. Oh, and it was like six. How many chocolate bars? You'd always be like, here's 20 oh. bucks. Get me as many chocolate bars as you can. <laughs> Your diet was so fucking bad and gross. <laughs> well, I needed the sugar to get me through the day because I tried to be responsible and never did drugs during work times yeah so i always needed like so much stimulant yeah yeah I you know I, it's of fun that too so i was so fucking naive i didn't see it at all yeah you know like i was just i smoked pot and drank but i just did not see yeah. the uh because you also didn't hang out with us outside of the shop really back then either. no no like, no know, not until it's not until i started working there and and even then it was yeah. <clears throat> you by the time Minimal. i was yeah, by the time I was working there, well, you'd left even when I was still an apprentice. So my apprenticeship was three years. Uh, I always say you gave me my start and you gave me some of the best advice I've ever had in tattooing. And I, I, I still try to follow it to this day. It still guides me. Um, but there was a bunch of other people at Sacred Heart that yeah. after you were gone that really nurtured me and, I mean, fucking went out of their way for nothing to make sure that I got good information, I, you know. Dave, yeah. Dave Green made sure that I worked with everybody at every studio and got different perspectives, you know, like that was a great place. Yeah. I, I still think it's the best tattoo shop I ever worked in. Oh yeah. Hands yeah. down. Yeah. Right. And not just the quality, like it's just the, you know, I was vulnerable at the time. Like I was still fucking grieving and that, that was a really, that really shaped me in the way I move forward. I mean, things could have gone, continued to go badly for me, dark, but that yeah. really gave me something to work for and showed me a better way to live. And yeah, it was great. Yeah. Crazy thing that I remember is when you were still basically new on the floor of tattooing, you tattooed Bill Waverly as a walk-in. <laughs> yeah, dude. In my first like three months. Yeah. Bill Waverly. Yeah. Oh my God. So, Bill Waverly walks into the tattoo studio. Waverly and, inks for the people that are not putting two and two. Yeah. Together. And he, uh, he, he knew Adam. So he came there to see Adam and everything. And um, he's just shooting the shit with everybody. And he's answering my questions as a neophyte tattooer. I want to know everything there was about ink. I just, anything. Like, just fucking tell me. And uh, he was going to see Tom Waits. That's why he was in town. Um, and he said, oh, man, I'm having such a good time in Vancouver. I want to get a tattoo while I'm here. And I was like, oh, just ask the counter girl who's got time. And he comes back. He goes, you're the only one with time. I'm like, I ain't tattooing you. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm too new. You don't want me to tattoo you. Trust me. And he's like, well, I just want a maple leaf. I'm like, you definitely don't want me to do a maple leaf. I'm going to be so fucking gank. You know, <laughs> Dude, yeah, I don't. People don't understand how hard maple leaves were back in the day. Like, I wish I had an iPad back then, just for fucking maple leaves. Oh. Not realistic maple leaves. If somebody asked for a realistic maple leaf, it was like, yes, just oh. a straight can yeah. of flag maple leaf. Fuck I, that fucking thing. I remember he asked me. He goes, "Well, we should probably put a black outline around it, right?" And I'm like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, that's not the Maple Leaf doesn't have a black outline around it. We don't do that. <laughs> fucking save my fucking ass. And I think I took 45 minutes to tattoo that like loony size Maple Leaf on him. And uh, he was like, um, well, how much is it? I'm like, I'm not fucking charging you. Like you're fucking Bill Waverly. I'm nobody. You're answering all these questions. Like I, that's like, thank you. You know, and. He's like, oh, no, I'll take care of you. And uh, he sent me a complete set of ink. Nice. Yeah. 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 Very cool. He's fucking nicest guy, man. Yeah. And still doing it. Still kicking. 
still making the ink, still putting it, it out there. Yeah, totally. Yeah, he's yeah. That was a a great moment. I, that was Sacred Heart, though. People would come in all the time. I, I remember after yeah. one of the Vancouver conventions coming in. I oh, fuck Steve Moore, obviously. I think Phil Holt. I think I talked about this before, so it's nothing new. Uh, Corey Flatmo, Corey Flatmo, um, Dave C, Trevor McStay, all working in the studio. It's like yeah. Told the counter girl, don't book me anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was actually looking through pictures of that long ago, and I came, I found pictures of like Dave C tattooing a Sacred Heart in yeah. the nineties. Like, oh, so, cool. Vancouver convention would have been like two thousand and four. That would have been like the year I left Sacred Heart. Um, but yeah, like Dave tattooing Sacred Heart uh, in the nineties. Pierre coming out and tattooing, you know, in the nineties. I remember Jay Schroeder would always come in and yep. visit um, when he was in town because he was getting tattooed by the Dutchman. I'll never forget the day when I looked at the counter and Sacred Heart was super long, ba- those big windows, the sun coming through. So a lot of the times when you look towards the counter, it was just <laughs> silhouettes, yeah. right? You couldn't see anything. And I'm looking and there's like three guys, maybe four. And there was like a tall guy in the middle with like longer hair. And I'm kind of looking like, you look like an asshole when you walk towards the counter because you're like squinting at people. <laughs> like, um, But you get closer and I'm like, that's fucking Thomas Lockhart in Sacred Heart. I remember that it's day. Like, yeah, he like he brought those guys that were in from I think they were from Barcelona, and he had taken them up to the Anthropology Center at yeah. the UBC, and he was passing by and was like, "Yeah, like they, I, I don't go into any fucking shops." It's like, no, most people don't. Like I was a young no. tattooer, and I still had that kind of attitude then. It's like I would go inside tattoo shops in other cities. But rarely would I step inside shops in the same city because it's just yeah. Yeah, politics, I was... right? So him coming in there was like, that was pretty fucking crazy. Like, yeah. It was wild. Yeah, we used to get so many people coming into that shop. And people coming in, same, and, do, and don't find out until like years later where like Jody used to come in and hang out. And it's like, you did? And then he starts telling me stories of shit that was like, because he's like a fly on the wall in there. And he's like telling me this time where i'm like shooting the shit with chad and like like bugging him of course making fun of him shit and jody's like and he's telling and i'm like i i remember that i didn't know there was somebody even in there because jody was like yeah you were just straight up like yeah when i you know doing heroin all night and walked away and chad was like you're doing heroin like and he goes and I'm like, no, I wasn't. I've never done heroin. I like up. I don't like the down. But you know, and I'm like, I wouldn't have said that if I knew a fucking customer in there because I was saying it dead serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm fucking with Chad. And I remember Jody telling me this, and I'm like, You were there? He's like, Oh yeah. I spent like a week sitting in the waiting room. And he's like, wouldn't introduce himself. I was like, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> totally. you know danny gordy used to come in oh yeah when he was in town he was getting tattooed or no he was getting laser removal at uh, our beautiful laser clinic that was down the street so he would drop in sometimes and show his work and show, yeah we used to get so many people coming through that shop yeah it was so cool yeah you know that was and then yeah we, but anyway we let's get back to you Okay, I was just gonna say before before I was tattooing there, I can remember I got tattooed a lot there. I was getting tattooed as often as I could, and I wasn't making a lot of money. And a lot of people wonder how do you get tattooed a lot when you don't make a lot of money? But you just fucking budget it and you eat a lot of fucking ramen. This is the fucking way you do it. Uh, but I also was fucking a bit of a fisherman at the time, and I yeah. this, I started trading snowboard gear for tattoos at Sacred Heart. Yep. Because uh, I worked at a snowboard shop and I could get stuff cheap and I had snowboards and then I was a snowboard rep. So I had a bunch of gear and then I got into the fly fishing and fishing world and uh, I, I brought salmon in for everybody. And it was fresh sock I had caught and I knew what was going to happen. Everyone was like, oh, I've had salmon before. I was like, no, try it. Eat it tonight because I just caught it this morning. And uh, the next day, everyone came in and was like, that was the best fucking salmon I ever had. Can I get more? And I was like, yeah. I'm a tattooing league. Give me for salmon. <laughs> and it was awesome. It was the best trade I ever made. I was like, yeah. a, a half a sockeye would get me like four hours of tattooing. It was like, 
the guys yeah. could buy it for, for like 40 bucks if they wanted to, but it wasn't caught that morning. So I remember yeah. you brought me a, you brought me a star foam cooler with three whole fish in that. And you slid it on the floor into my station. And my customer was like, what the fuck is that? I'm like, that's fish. <laughs> like, what are you going to do with it? I'm like, I'm going to fucking it. eat it. And I'm pretty sure I ate all three of those fucking salmon in two days. Like, oh, fuck, man. I bought a bar. When I lived in that townhouse, I don't know if you were ever at that townhouse. When I lived in that, in that townhouse with Lee Macri, it was insanely expensive. But because you were bringing me that fish, I bought my first ever barbecue <laughs> just so I could cook the fish on a barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I moved out of that place, I just left the barbecue. <laughs> oh fuck. Yeah, that was uh it was so cool to be able to do that. I I got man, I got so covered because of salmon and fucking snowboard gear. <laughs> yep. I think I got my first moral board from you actually. Moro? No. Would no. Uh, no. Oh, I would have oh, got that. Oh, oh. No, you might have I would have had it. Uh, you were Jeff. Remember Jeff from Boardroom? Yeah, Jeff might have got you a Moro. Yeah. Did we sell? Because I worked Moro at the Boardroom too. But yeah. I ended up having a bunch of limited snowboards, and I think that's what everybody. I was trading everybody. Yeah. I'd written Moro back in the day, and yeah, I was getting them. boards from Jeff, and then I forget the name of the guy who I was tattooing. He worked at the distributor. Was it J and D Sports? Was that the company? Oh, was the it was distributor? not JD. Um, and they distributed like Moro, Sims, like a lot of the bigger companies. And I remember just going in there and being able to like grab shit. Yeah, yeah. Fuck, I know. It's on the tip of my tongue, but I know the place you're talking about. Yeah, it was yeah. like going to Time Bomb. Going to yeah. Time Bomb, and they were the urban wear distributors yeah. from all the West Coast. And his name slipped in my. It's Garrett? Man. Is it Garrett? Garrett. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and just going in there and just I remember my buddy um Jay Tripwire, DJ Tripwire took me there the first time and he's just like every I'm like, well, how much is there's no prices? And he's like, it's warehouse prices. And I was yeah. like, Yeah. It's like and I remember almost. leaving there with fucking arms so sore and tired because of how much shit I was carrying. And <laughs> it was like probably close to two grand worth of clothes, and I swear I paid six hundred bucks for it all. It was like that Great. was such a fucking amazing time in Vancouver. Yeah, like the tattoo scene was going off. Okay, that's a given. But the snowboard and skate scene was fucking blowing up. The DJ and club Huge. scene was blowing up. And all this Huge. stuff was happening. Like, like it, it was like this perfect our generation's time, you know, like yeah. in clubs and at bars and in culture and everything. It was that was a great time to be alive because everyone your yeah. age worked in some cool fucking lifestyle industry, you know? Yeah. No like, one's working in a dude, fucking office. I, I went and saw, um, Oh my God. Uh, Robert Anton Wilson speak. And I went to go see Robert Anton Wilson speak with doc Martin, the DJ <laughs> doc Martin wow. and Michael. Cause Michael was friends with him. And it's just like, you know, that dude is still like one of the biggest fucking DJs in Europe today. You know, and it's just, I remember it not long ago, I just messaged you, Michael. I'm like, was it Doc Martin that was with us at that? And he's like, yeah. He's like, I can't believe you remember that. I'm like, yeah, me too. I was pretty fucked up back then. <laughs> but then, but listening, it, to, listening to Robert Anton Wilson talk and talk about like Timothy Leary and shit was crazy. Like, yeah. So cool. Yeah, it was such a cool time. I, I, I hate to be like that nostalgic guy who's getting older and thinking about all that stuff. And I don't, I don't miss it. I don't want to go back, but I'm just so impressed with what it was like, you know, like, and maybe that's just when you're a young person, you're just so eyes open and what, you know, you're accepting everything. And as you get older, you close down, but yeah, no, it was a fucking great time. When tattooing was, was exploding. Like it was just, yeah. if you were a tattooer, it was so fucking rare. It was like someone Dude, meet you like, and they'd like tell Arlen their Johansson. Scarlett Johansson was coming into Sacred Heart and getting her jewelry changed because she was filming a movie. Um, I forget what it was called. It was like a high school, like or a college heist, like an SAT heist movie or whatever. And like she's just coming, like she's just a normal person. She wasn't a huge star yet. Like Lee Aaron, the singer, coming in. Yeah, yeah. And Chad Woodley going, "Hey man, anybody ever tell you you look like Lee Aaron?" <laughs> and she's like, "Yeah, yeah." 
<laughs> all the time. I am Lee Aaron. And he goes, yeah, right. Fuck off. Metal queen. And he walks away. And it's like, no, dude, we get famous people coming in here. Yeah. Idiot. <laughs> but I remember, oh, yeah. like Susan Sarandon walking on Granville and I was like wasted and I'm like, Oh my God, Susan Sarandon. She's like, Oh my God, a stranger on the street. And she hugged me. <laughs> oh, I got Goldie Hawn getting her furniture next door at the upholstery place done. Yeah. yeah it was, it was a great time. Just a wild time. That city was so fucking cool back then. Yeah. It yeah, is it would... not now. There's cool parts still. Like there's still oh, pieces, yeah. but it was so different back then. Like, like you said, it was just, there were so many things just like coming together and of like, you had the like dirtbag tattooers being shown at the Vancouver art gallery with <laughs> movie stars coming and just weird <laughs> shit happening. And you're going to clubs and these people are, everybody's just like, because you were like part of the cool crowd. But none of us are actually fucking cool. Like it's no, just like, know. what is fucking happening, man? Like, well, it, it's so funny because we it, there were so few tattooers. It, we it, you were a rarity. Like true. you were there were yeah. fewer tattooers than there were actors. You know, like yeah, there were fewer tattooers than there were rock stars. So you you just got elevated. And yeah. as soon as tattooing became this thing that people were like suddenly interested in, it was just didn't matter if you're a good tattooer. Yeah. You know, it did, yeah, it didn't matter. It was, you know? <laughs> it was like when I walked into Sacred Heart one day, and it was like everybody's looking at me. They're like, uh, "Yeah, some guys called looking for you." I'm like, "Okay." They're like, "Yeah, so like uh, they're from like the band Fear Factory." And I was like, "Oh, cool." Which guy called? And they're like, "Christian." They're like, "You're friends with the guys from Fear Factory?" And they were in town for three months, so we pretty much hung out every day for three months. Me and Burton would go snowboarding. Actually, Dave C came out. Me, Burton from Fear Factory, Dave C going fucking snowboarding like every day of the week. Big Lebowski came out. Me and Burton saw that movie nine fucking times. We <laughs> went in, saw it, walked outside, and we're like, we should probably see that again, right? Went back in and saw it again. Christian and I were like more connected through like nightlife. Um, he was really in the drum and bass and stuff. So I was always taking him to all the drum and bass clubs or when he was getting into jazz and stand up, we'd go to the Georgia street hotel. They had Tuesday night improv jazz night down there. Nice. We'd go there. And then we'd go to like the red lounge for like some drum and bass or techno or whatever. And it was just crazy time. Yeah. So anyways, what was your first guest spot jumping out of that? Oh, Oh, first guess. Okay. So I, uh, I've been probably only tattooing at Sacred Heart for three months and my dad had cancer and, and I, I didn't want to leave Sacred Heart, but I had to, I wanted to be close to my dad. I didn't know how long it was going to last. So I moved back home and I was working in Toronto, Scarborough for a bit in a super rough biker shop with Bruce Smuck. Highway fucking, 2 tattoo. He gave me my first tattoo. He did my sleep. And he gave me my first job outside of my apprenticeship. That's cool. Yeah, always. Bruce I love always that. Cool. Yeah, he's the best. Yeah. And yeah. and then I was I went to Guelph to work, and uh, it, I was talking. I guess I just called Dave C. Like I'd met him right because of Sacred Heart days and everything. And I, I said I want to come out and visit my brother who's living in Montreal. Could I work at the shop a little bit? And he's like, it's dead here in the winter. And I was like, I don't care if I just sit around, like I'll just watch you work. So I went there and I think I was there for fuck, might have been twelve days. Fuck a twelve day guest spot. Like that's fucking, a long guest spot. Yeah. So, that's yeah. a that's a why are you still fucking here guest that's spot? That's a residency now. <laughs> so I it it was pretty dead and stuff came in and I turned it all down and said, No, I think Tony should do it. I was fucking terrified. I didn't want to fucking tattoo anybody in front of anybody. And yeah. uh, especially Dave. because At the time, he was my tattoo hero. And uh, met Tony. It was in the old shop. We had fucking a lot of laughs. It was a ton of fun. I got a ton of stories from that place and that experience. And then Dave tattooed my knee towards the end and uh, got me fucking wrecked on weed. 
I think there was tobacco in it. I can't remember, but it was great. Of course there was, because it's Ontario or it's Quebec, <laughs> yeah. East Coast. I oh, should put some weed in with this marijuana. Oh, uh, That's gross. No, some tobacco. Weed with marijuana would be great. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> That's how little I smoke weed. Oh, fuck. <laughs> but, the yeah, it was... It was cool to be in that in that environment. Uh, just you know, some shops. Uh, it's a bit different now because shops are bigger. But to be in a street shop that had a lot of character of the owners, like it, it, Tony's presence was there, like a hundred percent, and so was Dave's. And it, people came because of them, and pe people come to tattoo shops now because of them, because of who works there, obviously. But it was different. You know, Tony was this elder statesman, and Dave working with him was like, it's like a father son relationship. And there was so much history in that shop. And they were so in, uh, entrenched in that community points in Charles that yeah. it was just, it was cool to see people. It was kind of like sacred heart, but with just two people in it. For reference, Tony opened point St. Charles tattoo in Montreal. 72, 71, 70, 74, 76. Actually. Oh, okay. But if you want to know more about Tony, his name is Tony Danassa. Find the book by Mike McCabb called oh, yeah. New York Tattoo History. Yeah. And there is a whole thick chapter on Tony Danassa. If you've heard any crazy stories about New York tattooing when it was illegal, about like tattoos on blinds in barbershops, and when the cops would come by, they'd snap the blinds up and start pretending they're just like cutting the guy's hair when the cops walk by, that was Tony Danassa. Yeah. Check that shit out. Anyway, go on, dude. Yeah, so it was just, that was a great experience. It really told me what a tattoo shop could be. You know, like Sacred Heart was his family thing, but uh, Point St. Charles was, um, it was more about individuals and that their mark that they put on the shop. So when you walked in, you felt like you were in the presence of, it was just, I don't know, you just feel like you, you get enveloped when you go into that shop, you know, even the new shop the new shop that's been there forever is the same way. You know, you really feel like you get enveloped into something that's special. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And then First guess I'm back to say, Oh, I did. I, I remember this. I worked I, the time in Guelph was, I, I just had enough of the people that ran it. They were a non tattooer that owned it and a tattooer husband who I'm Randy he fucking works with me now. Me and him are tight. His ex, not so much. So I quit. And the only place to I could get a job being so green was at Lucky 13 in Toronto. And uh, Which I is went hilarious. <laughs> because that's not a green shop. <laughs> it wasn't, it's not when, no, it's not when Scott owned it. So oh. this, was at, this was after Scott owned it. Scott McEwen. Oh, okay. Uh, and it was, don't get me wrong. The guys that, the, I went there because... Um, the guys that work there, uh, Brian, Brian Turnbull, um, Colin Wiley, uh, Stuart, no, Chris, Stuart Archibald there. No, uh, he somebody else was there. <laughs> Fucking weed has just robbed me of my memory. I'm glad I don't smoke anymore, but I went there and they were like, we'll pay you 50% and you supply everything. I was like, Oh, okay. Sure. Uh, how's it? How does a walk-in thing work? Well, you kind of, Everyone else here has seniority, so if there's not if they're all busy, then you can have it. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, where's my station? Um, they kind of looked around. They're like, well, let's go into the back. And they're walking down this hallway, and it had a dog leg in it. And they're like, oh, we'll just put you here. I was like, okay, no problem. So for three days, I watched everybody tattoo. Nothing came in, and then they said, oh, I said. Uh, I don't know how this is going to work. And they're like, well, if you want to be busy, we could send you to Niagara Falls. We have a shop down there and it's super busy. Like, okay. So I went down and sure enough, I worked from fucking the minute the doors open to the minute they closed. I think I did, I don't know, 20 something tattoos or something. I made 500 bucks. Not a lot of money for that much work, right? Like mm -mm. should have made like thousands. You know? <laughs> and, uh, so I called Dave Green on my lunch break. I had a 30 minute lunch break. Um, I didn't even see fucking Niagara Falls. Like I drove down there. I worked and I didn't even see the falls. I left right afterwards, but I called him on my lunch break. I said, this isn't working out for Is me. Is that shop know? now owned by a non-tattooer? 
It was owned by Eric. Oh, fuck. Eric, he was notorious back then. Eric, uh, fuck, what was his? He ended up owning a shop in, I think he owned Reactive in Kings, uh, Kensington. Uh, yeah, Lucky Thir- he owned Lucky he 13. Owned Lucky- he bought Lucky he bought, 13 off Scott. Oh, I, th- I think it was the way cool shop he bought in possibly in Niagara. Niagara Falls. And, yeah. And renamed it Lucky 13 or something. I can't remember. Okay. I spent I spent a day there. Um yeah. and I called Dave Green at Sacred Heart and I was like, this isn't working out for me. You know, I'm I can't do Ontario anymore. And my dad was getting better by that time, and he said, Because your timing's perfect. When can you get here? And I was like, What do you mean my timing's perfect? He goes, Jamer. We just got rid of Jamer. And Jamer had taken my spot when I'd left Sacred Heart. <laughs> it was just like this revolving door. So I was like, I can be there in, I guess, a month. I should probably give people notice. And he's like, we'll buy you a plane ticket. Get here as soon as you can. So I think I was back there within a week or something. But nice. Yeah. And then how long were you there for? Again, not long Which enough. Which location were you at? I worked at all of them. Oh, okay. Yeah, I worked at every location. So there's three Sacred Hearts. Uh, when I was an apprentice, I helped Dave and Greta build the Nelson, their third studio. Uh, they were towards Nelson the end was of the second. Nelson was the second, the one on, or sorry, no, Davey was the second. Yeah, sorry, Davey Nelson was, like, was a, yeah, yeah, Davey was the third, or Nelson was the third. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The they, just, they just opened the, when I started getting tattooed, they just opened the Davey one and then the Nelson shop opened and they're towards the end of the Reno and I, Help them build that and then serve my apprenticeship. Anyway, I came back to Sacred Heart and I've worked at all three studios. Again, Dave, just get me to work with as many people as possible. And because I was the low man on the pole, just filling holes where they needed somebody. Yeah. 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 That was great. It's fucking awesome. And then you moved on. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Dustin. I had a heart to heart with Dustin and then uh, we'd, gone our separate we'd been really close we went our separate ways and then i reached out to him again and he said he was going through a real hard time so i drove up to vernon to see him i could tell it was something serious and uh we just spent three days together in the shop hanging out chatting and i basically said i think i'm gonna move up here and and he was like uh i don't know if there's work for you and i was like you need somebody in the shop because you're not in a good spot and I need to work under somebody that inspires me. And Dustin's work was yeah, like some of the best around. And uh, yeah, I ended up working with him. It was fucking great. We opened up another shop. Uh, we like, we closed the one shop, opened a, the best tattoo shop ever to the two, operate. The two story. Yeah. It was the amazing. Spiral staircase. Yeah. We found Stainless the spot. Stainless steel floors. In the alleyway. It was $350 a month for it was 250 square feet split over two floors. So that you walked in the bottom and it was a sliver. There's a spiral staircase with a scrub room in behind bathroom. And upstairs was like an L with two stations that we set up stainless steel floors, upstairs, hardwood so floors, downstairs, cool. hardwood floor, ceiling, exposed brick. And then the 17 foot fucking massive wall that was just floor to ceiling with art. And, uh, it was in an alley with a fucking gravel parking lot. It was, yeah. And we didn't have signage for the first year. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I remember coming and working there. It was so fucking cool. Three fifty a month. Yeah. Like, fuck. Why did we ever yeah. give that up? I did one of my favorite tattoos in that shop. I forget where you were. I was there by myself. I was probably I fishing. I was probably and fishing. Probably. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's where I, that's the shop I learned that I didn't like solid ink. Or no, not solid. Sorry. Uh, classic. Classic. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because I yeah, probably yeah, had a ton was, of it. You had a ton of it. And I yeah. tried it. And it was like, <laughs> this stuff sucks. Um, but I did one of my favorite tattoos there. Just totally normal girl walked in. I was like, oh, do you tattoo on the inside of the lip? I'm like, I haven't done one in years, but sure. I'm like, it's not comfortable. You have to hold your own lip over a pencil. She's like, I don't care. Roll over. I'm like, okay, what do you want? Good form. I'm like, okay. Nice. She's like, it's not what you think it means. And I'm like, okay. 
<laughs> Vernon's a special town. <laughs> it had some really interesting characters. It probably still yeah. does, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Oh yeah. My god. Yeah, Dustin was amazing. He would uh I learned if, if I ever learned anything about drawing, it was from Dustin. You know, I think I stumbled my way. I still stumble my way through, but I, I think up to that point, I was really trying to figure shit out. And he just had a great way of taking your drawings, which I'm sure he learned from John and putting tracing paper over top of them and just reworking the drawing with you, walking you through every part of it. And then you go back and you redraw it and you get all that information. Like, cause he just did it. It was, I, I could never thank him enough for that. Yeah. And uh, we just became super tight, best buddies, bros. Like, yeah, it was awesome. So you got your nickname, Forty Grit. Yeah, uh, no, <laughs> I didn't get it from him. <laughs> oh no, no, Kirk Bassingthwaite. He's uh, he's the one who originally introduced me to Dustin. We used to be roommates. He nicknamed me Forty uh, Grit. <laughs> okay, I used uh, to be way grittier before. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Dustin used to always be like, hey, when you work with Dave, if you ever want to really piss him off, just whistle death metal. Oh, fuck, dude. <laughs> and then you'd be like, but it's not fucking whistling. It's just. <laughs> I fucking hate whistling. Still hate whistling. I had a client the other day whistling. I wanted to punch him in the face. <laughs> Super nice guy. And I'm like, why the oh. fuck do you have to ruin it by whistling? Oh, it's God. blues Shaky music. <laughs> yeah, Shaky D was the best. Yeah. Oh, fuck. Yeah, just. Just get 40 grit going. Just whistle. Just whistle to death metal. Oh, fuck. Yeah, we had so much fun, man. Yeah, you guys bought and sold that shop to each other how many times? <laughs> oh, fuck. Because so, you yeah, were we, there together. Yeah, yeah. So we moved into that shop. We worked together. I can't remember. Like maybe a year and a half or something. And Dustin was really missing having a mentor. So he wanted to move back. John had an opening, so he wanted to go back there. So he went down to the Dutchies. Dutch Dutchman tattoos. Yeah. Uh, worked there for like a year and a half, two years. I was coming back home and doing guest spots and just said, I, I miss being here. I've had enough of the city. I want to come back. So when he left, I bought the shop off him. He gave me a fucking killer deal. He gave me terms. Like the number was so fucking low and the rent was so low, but he was like, you can pay me back over like a year. And I was like, okay, that's super fucking simple. He came back and then, uh, so now he's working for me. Like <laughs> not really, but I guess we we just split everything. And then, um, I, I was going crazy. I've been going crazy with fishing and stuff. And I left, uh, and sold him the shop for the exact same deal. <laughs> In fact, same terms and everything, just pay me every month. And at one point I called him and I said, if you can pay me the rest of it, I'll cut I'll take a thousand dollars off the price. <laughs> the it was so dumb. It was so dumb. Uh, yeah. Is that when you left tattooing to go and be a guide and professional fly fisherman? I was never a guide. I never guided. Oh, okay. Uh, I thought you did guiding for some reason. No, nah, my friends were all guides. So I used to hang out with guides at hang, camp out in the guide shack and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. oh yeah. Summers all night. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of tattooers can relate to getting burnt out on tattooing. I think in your first five years, you probably have a lot of self doubt. And I know I was going fucking crazy when Dustin wasn't there. I just constantly thinking I wasn't good enough. I wasn't measuring up. I, I didn't tattoo anything that I could get excited about. If I got excited about it, by the time I looked at the picture, I, I hated it. Uh, and I was escaping to fly fishing. I was really fucking good at it. It was peaceful. It, if, if you've ever fly fished and spent time on a river swinging flies for trout, uh, or steelhead, you know what I'm talking about. You can just get lost in time. You know, a 12 hour day can go by and you haven't eaten anything or drank any water and you're Sounds dehydrated. Like huh? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like tattooing. Yeah, but there's, it's different because it's complete, it different. total yeah. stillness, right? And uh, being in nature is just so comforting. Uh, so, yeah, I, I ran away. I was always escaping. And then I, uh, before that, I'd, 
picked up sponsorships from a couple of companies. I was an ambassador. I was, I've been doing some magazine work. I've been writing articles. I've been featured in magazines. There's a, a big magazine back East. They were doing, um, uh, trying to break into video and do TV and stuff. So I was hired and worked with a team to do some episodes and stuff like that. They flew us to Alaska, Colorado. I fished all up and down the coast, like at fly in places, all this remote stuff. I was fucking amazing. I, I, you know, if there, I was just telling someone the other day, if I was ever masterful at anything in my life, it was fly fishing. You know, I could, I was good at casting. I was good at finding fish. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, but there's no fucking money in it. Like, no, no. So I came to that realization and I was going to fuck off up north and work in the oil fields. I figured I'm just going to quit tattooing. I get, I keep fishing and I'll just work seasonally. And then I went in to see at Sacred Heart, I needed to make some money. So I went in, did a month long guest spot, hung out with Steve Moore the whole time. And he gave me this fucking awesome pep talk. And he just said, uh, you can't quit tattooing. You're a good person. Tattooing needs good people. You can work hard and get better at tattooing, but you're good. You're good with clients. You, the tattooing needs someone like you. Don't give up on it. And I had so much fun tattooing there again that I was just like all charged up. I was like, fuck yeah. So back to tattooing. Because <laughs> <laughs> I basically had a year off. Like I hadn't. Yeah. I, I would come into town and tattoo for two, three days and then fuck off for two weeks. Because my rent was $350 a month and I lived in my friend's room that was like dirt cheap. So I could pay all my expenses just by working two, three days and take two weeks off and then come back two, three days and do the same thing over and over. Yeah. But got to make money. Then, so where did you land? Did you land oh, back in? No. You know what I did? did? When did you end up in Ontario? Yeah. So I did a, after that, I, I got on the road and I had no... I didn't know what I was going to do. So I just tattooed my way across Canada. Yeah. Which, Cause this was I, the time, this was the last time I bought your bike. Cause we used to buy and sell that Gary Fisher <laughs> between each other, <laughs> between each other, back and forth, back and forth. And the last time I bought it from you was because you were going across Canada yeah, yeah. to never come back to the West coast. <laughs> no, but what I, what I did was I, how did that work? I can't remember. I must've, I'm, I think I went out east to do a guest spot, but I tattooed my way across. So I worked in, I think I worked in Calgary and Saskatoon and Regina and uh, Winnipeg and hit all yeah. the, the good friends and spots along the way. Yeah. And you were collecting every Scott Veldone machine along the route. Yeah. I ended up with I remember seven, that. Too. I think I might've had seven or nine of them or something. And I, like yeah. talking in set, I was obsessed. So I, I kind of drove the value up, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, let me get, I'll, we'll get back to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I went out and I did a guest spot with Scott Duncan and, uh, cause he'd come out fly fishing out West. I'd done a guest spot there before and I put him on the spot. I was like, I, I want a job. And he'd always said, if you want a job, they got room. And he lived in this tiny town in the middle of fucking nowhere and they're busy as fuck. And, uh, did a guest spot and then I drove back home and went through all those same fucking shops basically and sold all those Veldones back to other people in the shops because they had done such a good job of driving up the value. I think I made a hundred, 150 bucks off each machine I bought or something like that. Never fucking used them. <laughs> oh man. And then I drove, yeah, ended up back in Ontario. Yeah. With Scott Veld uh not Scott Veldon with uh, Scott Duncan at Sugar Shack yeah, tattoo. Sugar Shack. Fuck, that was great. Everything that mm -hmm. Dustin was for art, Scott was for uh technical ability. I mean Scott could fucking draw. Don't get me wrong. But his the biggest thing I picked up from him was the technical ability. That guy can if you don't know who Scott is at Sugar Shack Tattoo, look him up because he's he's Vaughn Scotch on Instagram. He freehands almost everything. He can do almost anything. And he comes from an era yeah, like... He did, share, uh, he did Sheila's orange blossom sleeve in like... Nine and a half hours at the, at the convention. Yeah, at a convention, one shot. Drawn on. And it, like, year, like, years. I got to see that thing age, and it aged 
perfectly. Just so good. Yeah. He he's from an interesting time because he's kind of predates like I think he started like early nineties, maybe late eighties. Like he's just on that cusp of like he was pre the nineties hype, you know? And uh so his stuff looked and he went to Europe a lot, so his stuff looks a lot like uh like Philip Blue stuff or um Oh, what's his fucking name? Bernie Luther was a big influence oh, on him. And yeah. it was, yeah, it was cool to see a different style like that because tattooing in the East Coast or the East was way different than the West back then. 100%. You know, their Japanese was different. Their traditional was different. Everything they did was just a different twist on it. Yeah. 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 So many good hidden gems back there, man. Like yeah. Lanny Glover. Like, yeah. So, like, so many good people. Oh, like, fuck. Well, we were back there. So Scott and Mike Austin are really good friends. And uh, we drove down to London from King Carden, which, again, is in the middle of fucking nowhere. Uh, just because Mike was having a birthday party for a shrunken head that he would bought the year before. And a legit shrunken head. Not like something you'd find, like made up by somebody like from Borneo or something like that. So we went to this, went to his shop and he had it all in a glass jar and we took it to a restaurant <laughs> to celebrate. <laughs> right. But on the way yeah. there, we had to go through, like we took a shortcut through these alleys and we came out of an alleyway and there was like a parking lot and this venue was there. And I look at the marquee and it said clutch with the date. And I asked Scott, I'm like, what's the fucking date today? And Clutch was playing that fucking night. And at the time, Sweet. a huge Clutch fan. So we went to dinner for the shrunken head, had a great party. And then we ducked out early and went back to the club. And they were sold out of tickets. And I said to the doorman, I was like, dude, I'm from fucking BC. We've come. And I fucking lied. I said, we've come all this way. Like, can we get in? And he was like, he looked around. He's like, yeah, just fucking get in there. We went nice. in, we got drinks, we turned around, put them down on the on the bar where we were standing. Clutch walked out. It was a fucking great show, man. It was so it was awesome. I still remember the drive back from there talking about the show and talking about tattoos with Scott and talking about Mike Austin and yeah. Ontario's a special for tattooing. I, I yeah. I don't think it gets enough focus, you know, like that era of tattooing. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the first time I saw um, Mike Austin tattooing. I actually bought a T-shirt from him. It would have been in '93. I think it might have been '93 Montreal Tattoo Convention. So it was Chris Trevino, Eddie Deutsch, and Lance. Lance's last name is slipping my mind right now. He worked at Sacramento Tattoo with Scott McEwen. He had like a Dan Higgs back piece. Just oh fuck! The nicest dude, nicest fucking guy. So cool. And right beside him, Mike Austin nicest fucking guy yeah and he was tattooing a girl i knew from scarborough okay small fucking world i have i have a daughter with a girl who we don't talk i don't talk with anymore and her best friend is getting tattooed by my, oh my husband God. right beside me but anyway at one point in time mike was like shaking his bottle of ink and you know sometimes you leave them open you forget and he's like talking or whatever and oh ink's my going all over. so she was getting an ankle band so she was like bent over a chair you know not in the most comfortable position and he's like shaking and it looked and there's ink all over her backside and he was like mortified and then he wouldn't like take her money like he finished the tattoo dude this tattoo was it was just maple leafs blowing in the wind around her ankle so fucking good because they were changing seasons as they were going around. Wow. So fucking good. So good. And he like was trying not to take any money. And she's like, I'm paying you. I'm paying you. And like, that was pretty crazy. That was a year that um, Gil Monty showed up. Was tattooing out of Jonathan Shaw's booth. Like just took Jonathan Shaw's machines. And started tattooing other people with them and stuff. And Jonathan Shaw was very upset. <laughs> we should get Gil Monty on here. That would be great. <laughs> I'll make a he'll phone call. I'll make a phone yeah. call. <laughs> yeah, he'll do it. Um, 
Yeah, I don't even know if you remember that, but that was uh, I remember that because I remember that was the same weekend that um, my mentor was a garbage man at the tattoo convention. But nobody Pretty knew who start. he looked like. Nobody knew who what he looked like back then. So he just dressed like a garbage man and just with his hat and and he went up to Jonathan Shaw and was like, "I'm here to pick up the trash. Hop in and open the bag." <laughs> Jonathan, says, who the fuck does that guy think he is? And he just <laughs> wanders away. Dude, that weekend was fucking crazy. It was uh... hilarious. So many fun, crazy things. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Such yeah, so cool. We should get Gil on. That'd be great. Yeah, it'd be fun. He'll have lots to say. I know. We'll have to. Yeah. Yeah. Might edit have to it. Add. Yeah, might have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it'll be our first edited episode. So, <laughs> yeah, there'll be some changes coming to this podcast over the near future. People will notice some things might change. Uh, <laughs> So with right. editing and some other stuff we want to try and definitely like make the quality better i know yeah, yeah. i've i've been hearing you guys you guys have been telling me <laughs> john your microphone sucks <laughs> not just me dude no like, i know i know simon sounds like he's in a fucking aquarium in this last episode but but yeah we'll figure it out we'll get there we'll get yeah there. totally but uh all right so sugar shack you were only there like two years. Two years almost then, to the day. Yeah. Yeah. And then you left and came back west like you said you would never do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I came to, uh, went to Craftsman and worked with Clint. That's right. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was yeah. fun to come visit. <laughs> oh, man. Clint's, he's like the, the consummate host. He's the, he's a great teacher, like great great teacher kind of like dustin you learn from the same guy but you know he, he fucking lives and breathes and dies for tattooing yeah. like it's not bullshit like it's everything it's crazy yeah. like so many people talk about tattooing and how much they love it but no one loves it like he does yeah well it's funny it's i was glad you went and worked there because it's one of those things again right like clint and i literally worked five minutes apart never spent any time together yeah you know what i mean like i remember we were at dinner one night and he was like i think some of your friends beat up my friends one time in gas town <laughs> i don't know how i feel about that i'm like i didn't do it like oh. you know what i mean like it was because there was those old circles of friends and the oh, tattoo yeah. shop politics all that stuff so it was great because i never spent time with clint so then like you're there and it's like come out for a guest spot i'm like okay you know, Rob Hope was there and yeah. Kaya Hype, yeah. you know, Kaya was there and it was great coming out and, you know, and then finally spending time with Clint and yeah, listen to him, like just asking a simple question about a painting he did and his explanation. I was like, uh -huh. I just learned something. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> like without even trying, it was just like, he like so eloquently can explain like yeah. his process of what he does i was just like i i probably should, i want to spend more t i need to spend more time here you know yeah. but unfortunately with my life at the time and you know marriage etc and stuff like that i just didn't was not unable to do anything long i was i did a lot of fucking guest spots because i was always trying to like be up that i did more guest spots probably than most married people did <laughs> but <laughs> but you know it, it would have been great like i remember at one point in time i wanted to we were i was going to leave alberta and I, you know i got a job with clint and then it was like i'm not going to make it and that's when i told bobby trip hey you want to move to bc like i'm passing up my spot at clint's place I, he'll give it to you for sure and bobby was like really bobby trip went and work there you know so i just yeah yeah you going me being able to just go and hang out there was that was cool a, enough you know like, that was a yeah that was a great job we had a lot of good times there there's so many good things Uli. that's Uli's the restaurant well, that was you know i got to hang out with dave shore you know towards the end of his life um yeah. uh fucking working with rob hope like on a semi-regular basis and sabotaging his station as often as possible that was around the time you started planning the Hold Fast Day Gold documentary. No, nope. no, I think nope. no. Jody and I talked about doing something 
in that vein around that time. But I left uh, when I left Craftsman, it was to go travel. And I, I know had, it was to go travel. I, yeah. But I mean, like that's when you started, kind of like. Yeah, and I think the I'm, movie, the documentary idea. Yeah. The idea was then, but yeah, there was no no movement on it just because I was fucking off, or that was the plan was to fuck off yeah. indefinitely. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Again. yeah. So many hmm? again, again. Yeah. yeah, you know what? You know what was it? So Craftsman was great, um, and I remember having all these conversations with clients, and I asked everybody the same question: What would you do if you won? the lottery like you won 50 million dollars like fuck off money like 50 million bucks you could do anything what would you do and everyone had their story and my story ended up i realized what my story was was i would fuck off like what do you mean i'd be like i'd be a fucking ghost i'd i'd be a postcard i would just travel and and see the world and they were like oh that's crazy and then one day when i was telling a client i was like I said to him, I said, I don't need $50 million to do that, do I? And they're like, no. It's like, I wonder how much money I would need to do that. I sat down and kind of figured it out. And I was like, fuck, I can tattoo anywhere. I don't, I don't live lavishly. Like I could, I was like, fuck, you know, at the time I was, I'd started paddling stand up paddle boards. So I was really wanted to start surfing and stuff. I was like, fuck it. Where's cheap that I can go. And it was like, Indonesia was like top of the list. So I sold everything I owned and fucked off. Uh, it doesn't take that much money. <laughs> no. no. You know, I was, I was going to tattoo, but I told myself I'm taking the first year off. I'm not going to tattoo for a year. I'm just going to travel and surf and paddle. And... Yeah. Didn't make it a year, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where did you end up? Uh, back in the Okanagan. Yeah. Uh, where did I, you meet? Where did you meet Tamlin? Paddle Center. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. After so I never, Indonesia. Yeah, I've been traveling, and uh, my friend Peter from the fly fishing world is one of my best friends. Uh, killed himself. I came home and buried him. Uh, I was in Komodo, basically, where the Komodo looking at dragons and shit, and uh, came home, buried him, and I felt. It was kind of fucked up that he killed himself, but I felt really good about traveling and dealing with that grief. You know, I'd had a lot of experience with grief in the past and I was like, no, I feel good about this. This will be good. So I flew, booked a ticket to Hong Kong to go see Dust Wu and I was going to go back to Indo, surf some more. Uh, we spent the night hanging out, eating food, got up in the morning, went for a walk, came back to the hotel room, found out that Dustin had killed himself. So I hopped on a plane that day, had the same crew that I'd flown over with. Like they were wondering, it, it's such a short turnaround. I came home and, and I realized that I was not able to deal with that grief. So I- That was uh, a rough one. Yeah. Yeah. It, I'd lost two of my best friends two weeks apart and I was totally, I didn't know I was lost again. You know, like, like I was before I got to Sacred Heart. I was completely lost. I didn't know uh, what to do. So I knew that it would be bad if I was alone. So I stayed. I asked Nick and Krista at Five Fathoms if I could stay and work. You know, I, I told them I'd stay for three months, make sure that they were their business didn't close. And then after that three months, I was like, can I stay? I think I need to deal with this shit. And I didn't deal with it well. You know, everyone tries their best, but... Uh, and then, so did, I think a year and a half at five fathoms and then moved to Kelowna with Michael moved up and we opened private studio together, strong heart, which eventually became third sun tattoo, which is now the Ginkgo tattoo club hmm. and met Tamlin at the paddle center, my partner. I never thought I'd ever have a partner like a forever person. Me neither. No, I was. And fucking, I remember like. Seeing pictures on Facebook because you didn't, I didn't know for a long time that you were seeing somebody seriously. Um, I think it was something you were probably just holding close to yourself for whatever reason. But I remember like you posting pictures on a travel, and I was like, these fucking pictures have to be taken by somebody else. 
<laughs> and then you tell me about her. And I was like, oh, and then you brought her to Edmonton. Yeah. And crashed up my place and stuff. And I was just like, yeah. And now it's been eight years. Seven years. Yeah. Seven years. Yeah. 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 You know, I definitely, you know, I was a bachelor. I was, I loved it. You know, I had a, had a good life. It was selfish living, but I think that was from, uh, that ties into me losing my brother and me, that my mindset at that time was I could fucking die at any time. So my brother yeah. was taken. He wasn't, it wasn't an accident. He was murdered. So I was had this like fucking mindset. Like I need to go out and do for me. And you do that for long enough. That becomes your habit. So I just yeah. never had healthy relationships or good relationships with women that lasted. And then Tamla came along. And... Yeah. You know, when I started paddling in White Rock, I remember paddling and being like, this is how I'm going to meet a girl. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So every time I would move after that, I would think I'd sell everything when I'd move because I didn't want to carry it with me. And then I'd buy, as soon as I'd get set up again, I'd buy another paddle board. Start paddling again, paddling again. And then came to the paddle center, Kelowna Paddle Center, to do a demo with a friend of mine who was, had a shop and we were setting up. And the paddle center was like this... No one would know, but it's this beautiful, big old home on Lake Okanagan. And it's got, you know, hundreds of members that paddle and train every day. And I was like, this is fucking amazing. Met Tamlin, bought a membership right then. And spent every day there after work on all my days off, just like at Sacred Heart back in the day. Yeah. And after a year, you know, she's, she's awesome. Like right away, you know, she's a special person, but. I didn't want to fuck it up. So I was like, I like the paddle set. <laughs> I like coming here. I don't, <laughs> You're I don't being want smart. to, yeah, I don't want to follow my usual path that I have with, with women, which is, you know, just, I just bided my time and then she couldn't wait any longer and <laughs> I ended up initiating everything. So yeah, couldn't be happier. And then moved into the fucking paddle center and now I train on outrigger and surf ski, which are, obscure niche sports <laughs> google surf ski if you want to know google outrigger if you want to know and um just train every day and have balance I, shops a fucking block away yeah. yeah someone loves me i love somebody life's great man and now you're about to take off again but with well, somebody i don't think we're good we're not leaving the okanagan that's not the plan. We might no. buy we might buy a place, a townhouse or a condo, but we're going to be well, out of here. We're not going to have a place, so might as well take advantage. There's no, no rush exactly. to to move into a place, and yeah. we've got well, a year to why save. Own, why own a, a van life van if you don't do any van life in it? That's true. This trip won't right. have anything to do with our van, though. Sadly, I guess yeah. You're not gonna really you can't drive that to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. Well, and she's got Tamlin's got family and. Uh, New Zealand. So that would be, we're going to go New Zealand right afterwards. Oh, okay. And then probably just we're there, I guess, go to Australia. And then, yeah. And then we're there. So we might as well go to Indonesia. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're there. So Especially we're just going from to... Australia. It's like, it's what? Yeah. $5 to fly anywhere. I know. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah. Life's great, man. Cool. And, and it's, awesome. I owe a lot of that to you. I, I think oh, about it all. Shucks. Well, you don't, I don't owe my life to you, but I, I didn't I owe, say that, <laughs> but you, you opened a door and you, you know, that I never, it's amazing how just a simple meeting somebody can change your life forever. You know, like, like I was on a path and then it went this way. Like, I didn't fucking draw when you offered me an apprenticeship. So yeah. It's not like nowadays where kids have studied to draw and stuff like that. So for me, that was a really big left turn. Always appreciate that. Yeah. Cool. So I'll never yeah. get rid of me. Never. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew that. Right. I knew that. I remember the story of, of Bill, you know, basically apprenticing Scott McEwen. You know, Scott McEwen was a fucking like machinist. Yeah. Like, like, making tiny fucking parts for like airplanes and stuff like real that's terrifying like 
That's terrifying. Not, right? <laughs> not just like not just a regular like he was he was a very specific like machinist that did very specific shit. Like he was a very serious job oriented guy. But then you meet him and you're like, this guy's serious. <laughs> Right. And I remember Bill saying like, yeah, like he couldn't really draw or any, but there was just, you know, there was just that you just knew it was going to work. You know what I mean? Like, and that's what it was with you. It was just like, this guy's just natural curiosity and like want and stuff like that. I'm like, I think once he gets the actual, but like there's a lot of people that think they want a tattoo. Mm. Some will continue to do it after they try it, but I've met people like even Dan Soda from River Valley. He tried tattooing and was like, "Uh, uh-uh. uh." I think once you get bit by that bug, though, especially back in the day, it was kind of like, "Yeah, this this is never gonna let me go." Yeah, you try I- to shake it because it becomes all engulfing. You know, like we spoke to before. Like we spoke before, you mentioned how, like, you know. I our identity becomes tattooer. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a rough thing. You know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. So once you get that, and it just it won't let go of you until you can figure out like a balance and stuff like that. Like you're gonna live a pretty depressing life. Yeah, yeah. And then when you become a tattooer, you're probably gonna live a pretty depressing life for a while too. <laughs> that's what I mean. Like when you get yeah. bit by it and you learn and everything, yeah. and you're just like. Oh my God. And it's like, Oh, but at the same time, it's like for my mental health, I should give this up, but I can't cause it's fucking in me now. I'm yeah. now a tattooer. And well, I like, think that's, I think that's the danger with anything, with any profession or anything you do is like, it becomes your identity. I'm, I'm really conscious of that with everything I've done in my life. I know with fly fishing, it was the same thing. You know, I was a fly fisherman of, and yeah. one of note, you know, like a minor celebrity in that world. And if I, I can remember waking up and just being like, I don't, that's not what I want to be. I'm fucking more than that. And my dysfunction is that I fucking drop it and walk away from it completely. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think that's the date with tattooing. It's tough because you're dealing with people and the people component is such a big thing in tattooing it. It can, you can either rise to the occasion and get tons from your clients and, and that interaction, or it can fucking crush you because you realize the responsibility you have. You don't think your work measures up. The people can be really tough to deal with. Sometimes that's yeah. It's a tough career. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Buddy. Yeah. You made it through the short journey of your life. Short journey. Yeah. Fuck. An Fuck hour and thirty four minutes. Hour and thirty four minutes. You All made right. It. Cool. <laughs> you made it. You survived. And I just launched a new competition on the Hold Fast Social Club. I saw that. Yeah, it's a fun one. We're gonna so the winner gets to choose live online from three boxes at Good Guy. And one box will have nothing in it. One box. Oh, I, it. I, did, I just saw that you did something new. I didn't read the rules. Yeah. Yet. So one box has got nothing in it. One box is, will have like a t-shirt or a hat and the other box will have a, your choice, a Lucas Ford machine or a good pen. So you might not Amazing. fucking win anything, but you might also win a fucking <laughs> testing machine. <laughs> and they don't have to do anything but repost. Yeah. It's super simple, right? right? Yeah. Well, they got to so join not- whole, they got to join the social club because I'm running oh, a business, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that doesn't cost anything. <laughs> no, that's free. Like yeah. I mean, like they like they might not win something, but like they're still getting stuff in return. Like they're, yeah. you know what I mean? Like they're getting introduced to a new community that they may not have done before, and exactly, et cetera. Et cetera right? So yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, so, hilarious. Stoked on. Yeah, I'm trying yeah. to make it fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you guys should order. You know what you should order? Actually, you know, for the box for nothing, you should just order like like a middle finger, like brass, like a stamped brass plate, like that a key pops thing. up. No, no, but that's what they win. Like, and they oh, can yeah. put it on their, yeah. yeah like They're gonna big fuck you. Know. you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you can have like GGS F you on it. Yeah. <laughs> you want a prize <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll look into that. Oh. <laughs> Cast my own hand. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. I was I got my good pen. Oh, good, good. Brushed that out to me, threw some little extras in there for me. Um, cool. Let's talk I, about it. I would love to say I could hate it just to be a dick, but I can't. It's good. Like, it's it's really good. Actually, Kevin meant to use it while he was here. I just had Kevin Pregazer. His mom loves yeah. it when I say the last name because I get it wrong. It's Pregazer. When he says Pregazer, I'm like, yeah, Pregazer. Pretzel. And then he laughs. And I'm like, say it again. And then he goes, Pregazer. And I'm like, Pregazer. And then he laughs. And I'm like, dude, I'm saying the same thing as you. Like, uh, but he was so he was just with me for the week and uh, he was going to give it a shot. Um, but I guess he did. So I'll lend it to him in October when we're there for a week. But dude, like I use the, the Cheyenne Sol Nova. Well, first I use the Cheyenne Hawk that you sent me corded. Hawk. Was that a Hawk that I had? I thought yeah, it was a, they, know, or was it a tear Nova or something? I don't know. I can't remember. It was corded. I remember it was yeah, had yeah. a cord and, and it, I didn't like it for lining at all. No, I didn't um, either. And it was okay for solid coloring, but I didn't like it. I, I whipped too much, right? Like, even when I'm not whip shading, I'm still whipping too much. Um, so I didn't like it. Uh, the Soul Nova cordless I used, I did a hand with it. I It lined well, and it color packed super well. But again, like, kind of for me, like, the action wasn't really there. And then, um, but the hand healed great. Then I was using the uh, using stealing Wes's uh, FK irons a lot, yeah, the Flux S or whatever, and good mm. machine. I didn't like it as much for lining; it made me go slower, which yeah. you know, some people they would like that, but I I just I don't. Um, so lining was was okay for it. Um, I liked it the action for shading for me for the way I work more, but I didn't like it as much for solid color hmm. and then i get the good guy and i'm just like this is like lining with my dax coil machine like it, it's the crazy action right? on it's great and then same with like my like my whip style of like coloring and and shading and stuff like that it just the action just works really well for me i wish i could shit on it <laughs> just to like be an asshole but i i just can't like it's fucking it's they did a it's really good job with it yeah, you know, I think a lot of those pens, I think the mistake they make is they build in too much give and the cartridge yeah. has a lot of give in it. So now you've yeah. got like a lot of fun, like too much give and it's nothing at all like a coil. And I think good guy with Lucas being, you know, so hardcore with coils his whole life. I think he figured that out. Like, it, yeah, I, it's so much easier to line with, I find, than any of the other pens I use. From the first tattoo, it was like, I First. borrowed it. I borrowed it. And I did a tattoo, and I and I was like, "Well, I guess I'm buying this because holy fuck!" Yeah. Like, yeah, like when Lucas sent me that tester, like it just gave me the thing gave me anxiety because he sent one that had a problem. He didn't know, so I had to like jump start it <laughs> yeah. every time I had to plug it in. <laughs> but I like I remember pulling one the first line I pulled with it. I was just like, "Oh, there's going to be no learning curve." Yeah, for this. Which Whereas is a lot, great. a lot of rotaries, they always had learning curves. I found like I've tried lining with shags. I've tried lining with yeah. Neotats. You know, I've I've tried lining with Mike Batexta, like direct drives. I've tried so many different ones, and and none of them are bad. You know what I mean? I love to make fun of the dildo pens and stuff, but none of them are are bad. Just they just didn't work for me. It just was like. Not an easy transition. I can also tell for some people it's not an easy transition, but for whatever reason, they just won't <laughs> go back to what works better for them. They're just like, nope, I'm fucking using this because everybody else is using this. And I'm just like, what? Your tattoos are suffering. Like, but this was an easy, super easy trade. I'm so happy. I'm like, I nice. have all these coil machines now where I'm just like, I guess I'm going to sell these. <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie. I, I had a little bit of anxiety before this episode thinking that you were going to come on and shit on it. I was like, no, we just, <laughs> we just, <laughs> we just brought them on board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no. I yeah. wish I could. I wish I could. Maybe yeah. their second generation will be more of a um, industry standard for like different grips. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe, or maybe they'll come out with like different styles of grips, you know? Um, Oh, I've got I something actually, we can shit on. I, I like this. I like the smaller. I like those 
uh, shit, uh, the FYT foam ones. Uh, yeah, ones. I, I find those are, they don't fit all machines well. No, they don't. And like, but yeah. I just mean like, that's kind of, if this maybe something a little more like, like yeah, that, I, I, I don't I, I never had a problem with them, but I don't use much slide while I'm working. So they never get slippery because I know a hard grip can be like a bit of a pain in the ass if you get lots of slip on your hand. But yeah, I but know I use, something. I use wrap on everything. Oh, uh, gotcha. Yeah. You know what I want to. What are we shitting I want... on? I, got, I opened a fucking needle the other day and there's no fucking needles in there. <laughs> I put it in oh, the machine. That... I put it in the machine. I started running it and I'm like, are my eyes that bad that I can't even see it's not coming out of the fucking thing? Or maybe it's just, it's not, on, the grip's not on enough. And then I'm like, I take it off and I'm like, there's no fucking needle in there. I put it aside. I'm going to send it to Rob. <laughs> Nice. I want to be. No, dude, I've, I forget who it is. <laughs> Somebody actually has a, a five pack, like needle on bar five pack. It was in the box, and there's nothing in it. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I that's who it. it was. They showed me, and that's, that's they were like, "Good guy, no supply." Well, but that's not. I mean, we can laugh. No, about I know that. that's not. <laughs> it's out of their hands, right? Like totally. Fucking, some guy in China is like, "I'm not dealing with that." Right? <laughs> The person with the smallest hands that day that puts the needle inside wasn't at work. So they're just like, man, that one doesn't get one. Oh, fuck. <laughs> you know what? They're better They're better built than if they were built in Canada. Because the guys would be smoking weed all fucking day. <laughs> You'd have threes and yeah. seven liners. You'd have so fuck. Mags in liner tubes and shit. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. No. Oh, fuck. Oh, that's cool. I'm glad you like the pen. I mean, that's, that's, that's been what a, I do. Yeah. It's been a long time. I know. Time. Everybody, so you guys always bug me. Like, I was just talking to Julia the other day. I'm like, you know, I got my first smartphone <laughs> in like 2012 because I refused to get an iPhone. And I remember everybody's, what? Get a fucking iPhone. You can't have Instagram without an iPhone. For you young people that didn't know this, Instagram for a long time was iPhone only. No Samsung. <laughs> and and then we were at the bro down in Nanaimo at Rob Noseworthy's house. Oh, and you had yeah. an iPhone 3. And you were like, just fucking take it and set it up. <laughs> I don't remember that at all. <laughs> you don't? No, but that was a crazy weekend. <laughs> yeah, that weekend was great. I just like, how Nosworthy's many people like, are oh, you sleeping God. on the floor? I'm like, yeah. It's like it's hardwood. Lots care. of us slept on the floor. I know, I, but like, I slept with like nothing, no blanket, oh, okay. no. Oh, nothing. okay. I just slept on the floor. I think there's thirty My people on Rob's house that weekend. That weekend was amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that weekend was awesome. Uh, yeah, a lot of sausage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rob, uh, uh, Job, fucking manned the kitchen and made that big yep. feast for us all. It was great. James Tax, you know, being awake for twenty minutes had finished like three paintings. Yeah, just bullshit. No, oh, that was a really, fuck. really great weekend. Looking at those old pictures and stuff, it's that was a great time. Yeah, Doug Fink complaining like, "Oh, what's that fucking smell?" It's like fresh air. He's like, <laughs> "It's fucking disgusting." That's cedar. <laughs> he was so mad at the smell of fresh Vancouver air, island air, not Vancouver. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Salt water and cedars. <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh, <laughs> uh, he loves fucking oh. outdoors. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh my god, yeah, that weekend was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good job on the pen, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what can we review next? <laughs> Actually, I tried their slide the other day. Like, oh, which the butter stuff? The, yeah, the maple or whatever. Oh yeah, that's good. Um, I like it. It's it's really good actually. I'm not gonna. I'm, I'll I'll switch over to that because I don't really use Vaseline at all while I tattoo, which is not the most comfortable for clients. <laughs> but I hate Vaseline, so yeah. I don't use it. Right. I used to have stuff made, and then um, Sarah Brown was making stuff. The, yeah, uh, that stuff was salve, which is f amazing. It was very similar to stuff that me and Steve Moore used to have made back in the back yep. in the early two thousands. Ryan Gagne has had some stuff made since. I had a couple of jars of those and I ran out. But now that I've tried this slip, I'm like, it works fucking good. Yeah. But, I've been but I haven't seen, I haven't used it and then seen stuff healed. I don't like, 
certain products work really well for some people and then some people tattoo a certain way and it may not work as well. So that's why I don't use a lot of Vaseline just because the way I tattoo, I, I don't know. I just don't like it. So yeah, we'll see. We'll yeah, I don't I, like the uh, Supreme. Um, I just like the regulars. You don't know, like the are, loose shaders the, or hollows? No, the, I haven't tried the hollows to, uh, hollows are Keith Smith told me to try the solo the hollows. No, what are the ones yeah. that uh fucking straight? Not straight. Yes, no customs. What are they called? Semi tight. Semi tights. The nine semi tights. I do not like those at all. <laughs> I used one. It was like oh. I gave the box to Kevin. I like the. I'd rather use the uh, standard eleven in place of that. For me, again, for the way I tattoo and the way I pull lines. Yeah, yeah. Um, the hollows are really good. Uh, yeah, Heath Smith was like, "Oh, dude, you got to try that." So I'll be, I'll be trying those next. So I wish they would make really, a eighteen hollow. I would love an eighteen hollow. A rotary will push it. Fucking do it. <laughs> fucking do it. Um, I, you know what I, I really don't know what the difference is. So Lucas, when we see you in Calgary, I want to have him on so we can talk about some techie stuff. Would be great. Um. Is there a difference in your actual needles and the grind and everything from the say the 13 mag supreme and your regular 13 mags? Because I seem to like hmm. the good guy mag cartridges over the supreme cartridges. And I don't oh, know really? if there's a fucking real difference or not. I thought the only difference was apparently one doesn't have the membrane in it or something, but I feel like the standards. Well, maybe that's it. Maybe the membrane has too much resistance. Maybe I don't know, but even with like, because I have like uh, old, maybe expired, uh, good guy <laughs> on bar, thirteen mags that even their newer mags aren't. I don't, there's something that's changed over time, <laughs> um, but I really like these old 13 mags that I have of theirs. And these 13 mag cartridges I got re- remind me of them. So hmm. I, don't know, I don't know. Yeah. Right? But I do know you change manufacturing, you do all kinds of things. I shit. Are they needles? Over time, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I wonder if the needle, like on the bar ones, if the needles are the same, but the bar material is different remember when back in the day we went through that thing when the bar started getting really soft and we were oh, like holy fuck. Soft. and we were just trying to source out just super stiff bars for our needles yeah i mean yeah. it could be some, it could be something like that right like <laughs> like what are they fucking just making these out of like solder <laughs> i can solder my needles with my needle bar <laughs> there was probably you know you know what's funny is so today um i forget the company they have stainless steel cups that are just being recalled i guess they were for kids but they're stainless steel and they're being recalled because of how much lead what? Is in steel yeah. so i wonder where they were made yeah three guesses so i'm wondering i'm wondering also if like that back in the day when we were getting the super soft needle bars they had like, a lot of lead in them there was probably a lot of lead in them and probably. that's why they were so fucking soft yeah no shit hmm It was great getting to know Curly and this amazing guy that tattooed with one arm. You know, the customer had to stretch his own skin. So I did get blood poisoning from him twice. Twice? Yeah, <laughs> twice. <laughs> Ed Hardy brought this whole uh, Japanese influence into American tattooing. Once Dave Shore come onto the scene, it was like tattooing completely changed. If anybody could say anything about greaseballed Japanese, it's fucking Dave Shore. Salty, piratey, bikery, just hard not to do. Man, he'd pull in on his chopper with the tattoos and the girls, and I mean, he was just like so cool, man. He captured vulgarity and pleasure and insanity and recklessness. Tattoo in the 80s or 70s. Just not the same, uh, yeah, you had to be a tough guy. I was scared shitless. Even though I was, a, you know, kind of a biker guy, these were bigger biker guys, you know? I'm not totally sure you could paint the picture accurately to somebody now getting into tattooing about what it was like then 
And the only reason I, f I would say or I feel that way, though, is because they might not believe you. We had the limo waiting for him with all the lines of blow lined up at the airport. This is the way we do it in Canada. <laughs> in the like 80s, 90s, Paul, Paul Jeffries was like the king of tattooing. It wasn't just in Canada. Like, am I supposed to stop tattooing? Because if this is what I'm supposed to aspire to, <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Each one of these old masters influenced groups of tattooers who in turn influenced other groups of tattooers. The True North Strong Tattoo Book. This is a massive tattoo encyclopedia of Canadian tattooers. 350 pages. It's an 11 by 17 coffee table format. Sean and Dan worked tirelessly to get this thing out. And sadly, it never made it to print. So it's available for free download at theholdfastsocialclub.com and championtattoo.ca.